been used this morning, church. Death could not hold you. The pill tore before you. You silenced the boast of a sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of you again to Grange Baptist Church and we're praying for the Lord's blessing to be upon us as we meet together around his word again this evening. I trust you've enjoyed today, it's been a beautiful day and I pray that you've known the blessing of the Lord even there in your own life. We come to consider a new character uh, this evening and throughout of course uh, tomorrow night and God willing Wednesday night also and last week we asked you to send in your guesses as to who it would be and nobody got it right and so we come to consider this evening the character of Adam. And remember last week we said it would be fundamental uh, to uh, study this man and so we come to consider the very first man that God created and truly within his life we see some key truths of scripture, we see some key truths to understanding Bible doctrine, we see some key truths also to understanding the great plan of salvation and thus he is a very important character to learn from and indeed to study together. We're turning our Bibles this evening to Genesis in chapter 1. Genesis in the chapter 1, and we'll read together from the verse 26. The Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. We'll end our reading there at the end of verse 28, but we'll, of course, be considering other scriptures as well. Now, coming to the creation account, here in the chapter 1 of the book of Genesis, we come to the very first chapter, and we come to a chapter which has been under attack for generations. 
Because Satan knows that if this chapter is undermined, if it's seen to be exposed as untrue in any shape or form, then it undermines the entire rest of the scripture record. And thus, that is why for many years, for many generations, there has been that debate over whether or not we are, we are truly living in a world which has been created by God or whether or not it is some process of change scientifically, which scientifically can be proven or explored and understood. And I trust that as we come to consider this uh, account tonight and as we look into the life of Adam that we're all in agreement that this world was created by God just as the Bible records. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, we're not coming to consider apologetics in any way, but it is worth noting that that is something that we do well to be unashamed of and indeed to speak freely of even in our day and our generation, especially among young people and children. For sadly, they are facing the very height of that battle there in schools and universities and colleges. And there they face the real anger and wrath of Satan in this area. And many will pour scorn upon our young people for believing that God created the world in which we live. But nevertheless, let us never shy away from that fact. Let us never let us be ashamed of that fact. And let us do all that we can to educate ourselves rightly and appropriately to be able to defend that truth and to speak at will about it. But we're coming to consider God's creative work at the, in the sixth day, the creation of man, that first man being Adam. And I want you to notice, first of all, that Adam was a person with status. Adam was a person with status. Out of all the other uh, creation, creative works of God during the, that week of creation, we see that man was set apart. We see that first and foremost in the very words of God that are given to us in verse 26. It says, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So the intent of God as he created man was that he might be given that position of status among his other works of creation. Those other works of creation would be subdued and indeed ruled over by this man whom he was creating. It's further given to us in verse 28 as God speaks unto man for the very first time. And it tells us God blessed them. God said unto them, be fruitful, multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And so once again we see that status conferred by God upon man that sets him apart from all the other works of God in the week of creation. And that is an important thing to remember. For as we consider the week of creation and come to consider the creation of man, Adam being the first man, we are looking at he who was the goal of God's creative work. The pinnacle of God's creative work. Truly God was designing a kingdom even as he uh, went about his work of creation. And in that kingdom, man would rule the earth as God created it. He would be God's representative here on earth. And truly that's what the Bible is teaching us here. For as we know that all uh, creation in a sense reflects God, uh, all creation in a sense testifies to the glory of God, it was man who alone would be the representative of God here on earth, having dominion, having power, rule and authority over the other works of God's creation. That was the intention of God during that week that is recorded here in Genesis chapter 1. But we notice not only that man was created and given that status conferred to him by God, but also man was created in a different way from the other works of creation. For in verse 26, we're giving that understanding. It says, let us make man in our image. And so remember the work of creation on the day one, day two, day three, day four, and day five, they went all according to the plan of God. The sun, the moon, and the stars were created according to the plan of God. The trees, the fish, the birds, the land itself, all created according to the plan of God. Even in the first uh, works of creation there in day six, the land that mammals and animals, we see again those who were created according to the plan of God. But when we come to man, we are coming to one who, yes, like all the other creative works, was created according to the plan of God, but much more than that, He was created according to the pattern of God. He said, let us make man 
uh, in our image and after our likeness. And what a truth here is being expounded to us. For here, mankind was being created after the pattern of God. He was in all things to be the representative of God here on earth. What a thought. What an intention of God here is revealed to us, even in that work of creation. And man, Adam, was the one who was created with a position of status, conferred to him by God, and truly borne out even in the record of Scripture as we consider how God spake about he whom he created. But not only, the, not only was he a person of status, but Adam was a person with a soul. Come across to... Uh, chapter 2 and remember hold in your mind at all times as we make our way through this point the fact that God said let us make man in our image and after our likeness who are we speaking of we're speaking of the triune God father son and holy spirit and so if man was truly created after the likeness of God and in the image of God after the pattern of God then we too should see in man that triune aspect to man that tripartite nature of man. Now some would say to us simply, no, there, there are those who hold that man is bipartite. He is simply body and soul. But I do not believe that to be a consistent interpretation of Scripture, and especially as we come to consider the creative account that God gives us here in the book of Genesis. Rather, I believe that God speaks very clearly to the tripartite nature of man. What are we speaking of? It is the fact that you and I and all mankind are created body, soul, and spirit. Now, not only here in the book of Genesis, in the creative account, do we come to this understanding, but we have this further confirmed to us, even by the Apostle Paul, and we'll come to dwell on that in just a few moments. But here in the creative work of man, our creative work of God in, uh, 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 in forming man, we see that God said, let us make man in our likeness after our image. And so we come to chapter 2 and it says in verse 7, the Lord God formed man off the dust of the ground. And so here we have the body. God is taking that dust of the ground and he's transforming it into the flesh that you and I can identify upon our own uh, bodies and all the organs that are contained therein all form from the dust of the ground. And you'll have heard that statement many times, perhaps at a funeral or perhaps even given in a sermon. From dust we were created and to dust we shall return. And it is that idea that since the fall, of course, the body of man has been that which decays, waxes old and will know disease, sickness and eventually death. And placed into the ground then, that body will decay further, rot and waste away. Until, of course, that glorious day of the resurrection. When the body and the soul and the spirit shall be reunited once again. Of the believer and the body and the soul of the unbeliever shall be reunited. And there spend all of eternity either in heaven for the believer or hell for the unbeliever. Oh, if you're an unbeliever tonight, remember that day will come and it's an inevitable and if you do not repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then so too will be your doom. Your doom also will be inevitable. Don't let that be so. Heed the words of God. Hear the invitation of Christ and come unto him and believe him as your own and personal saviour. But coming to consider this idea that man is tripartite, then we see that in verse 7 it says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, so the body. In the body, we know, of course, we have the different organs that allow us to function, allow us to know health and strength as we require. But also, of course, the body is that part in which we find those five senses that have been given to us by God in order that we might uh, truly know what it is to be alive. So we have our hearing, we have our sight, we have our smell, we have our taste, and we have the ability to touch and feel. And all those things are given to us by God to remind us that we are a living being that help us indeed to uh, do the things that we need to do. And yes, I know uh, there are those who perhaps know what it is not to have the full use of one or more of those senses, but nevertheless, those are what God has given to us in order that we might function, that we might be able to operate just as he intended, as a living creature here upon earth. But go on in our verse 7 of the chapter 2, and it tells us, and breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. 
What are we speaking of here? We're speaking of that part which was God-breathed, that part which responded then to God, because we see then that because God breathed into him, it goes on to record, man became a living soul. But that's that middle part there, that part that is being spoken of whenever it says there, and God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, we're speaking of the spirit of man, that which only God himself can make alive. And as we come to the, consider the creation account, we're coming after the days of the fall. We're coming whenever we are born in sin, shaped in iniquity, and therefore we are born dead in our trespasses and sins. That is, our spirit is dead. We have no ability in and of ourselves to commune with God, except we respond to the call in the gospel, except that when we respond, then God breathes into us and we become alive in him, we know what it is to receive new life in Christ, then we too shall know only the existence of our soul and of our body. But when God breathes in that moment of salvation upon the repentant sinner, God quickens his spirit. And that's why Paul said, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Because God breathes into us, just as he did into that first man, and he became that living soul, so too God breathes into us the breath of everlasting life. We have as our present possession that knowledge that one day we will be with him throughout all eternity, because our spirit is witnessed to by his spirit, just as we've been reminded by the Apostle John in our studies in 1 John that we've just concluded. And so here in the creation account, we see the body identified, we see the spirit identified. And then, as we've already read, we see the soul identified. And that soul is found in every human being. It's that soul that truly knows what it is to live forever. Now, you and I are not eternal. Eternal simply in the biblical language always means that which is without beginning and that which is without ending. Only God is eternal. He is without beginning. He is without ending. You and I rather are everlasting. That is, we know a point of beginning. That moment when we're conceived in the womb is our beginning of life. But nevertheless, as life progresses, we will never know what it is truly to die. Yes, we physically die, but for all of eternity, we will, our soul shall live on as we've already noted, either in heaven or in hell. Our soul lives forever. And as a man is breathed into by the breath of life, he becomes that living soul. And that truly set him apart from all of the other animals, all of the other creatures created by God. Why? Because in his soul was that ability to live forever, given to him by God. And yes, we're looking at man here and he's sinless at the moment of creation. As God breathes upon him, he's a sinless being. He has not experienced the fall. He has not transgressed the law of God at this very point that we're reading of here in Genesis chapter 2. And thereby, he is one who is created by God, knows a beginning, but truly he is everlasting before he becomes that living soul. And here the scripture record, I truly believe with all of my heart, shows us clearly that God created man with a body, God created man with a soul, God created man with a spirit. And therefore, as we come to understand that in ourselves and come to uh, further confirm that from other scriptures, let's turn to 1 Thessalonians in the chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians in the chapter 5. You say, why is this so fundamental? Why are you laboring this point? Why are you speaking about this? I'll explain that in just a few moments. It says here in verse 23 of 1 Thessalonians in the chapter 5, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul, and body, be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so here we see that Paul too identifies that man is a tripartite creature. He is that who has a body. He is that who has a soul. He is that who has a spirit. And as he's writing to the church at Thessalonica, he's writing to believers He's writing to those who have known what it is to have repented of their sin, believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who have known that quickening experience as God has made, made them alive in their spirit. And so he's speaking on to those who too have been regenerated. And he says their whole spirit, their whole soul, and their whole body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Note the order. Now Paul here identifies it's a very crucial order when it comes to that understanding of salvation because the part that truly matters to God is our spirit. 
Because that is what identifies us as a believer. Last night we talked about the battle of the soul. And that soul is that battle, or the battle for the soul is that which is ongoing right now. Because God desires for us to know what it is to be quickened in the spirit. Made alive in Christ. And to live and rule and reign with him eternally. But it's only ever known whenever we know what it is to be saved. And that truly marks us out as a child of God, our spirit. Because it's in our spirit then that God is witnessing that we are the children of God. The soul is that uh, secondary part. It's the most important part uh, for that for which we do battle for. Why? Because it's that which lives forever. Shall experience the pleasures of heaven or shall experience the terrors of hell. Then the body. The body is simply that which closes here down below. It's temporal. Ever waxing older and decaying just as scripture records. But nevertheless, it's very crucial here to understand that Paul too identifies man as being tripartite. Why is this all important? Well, it's important uh, because it identifies to us a key understanding from Scripture that leads us then further on to understand how God deals with man, but also, most importantly, what we understand about regeneration. If you hold the, uh, the bipartite view, your understanding of regeneration, the salvation experience, it's very much different from mine. Because those who hold bipartite view truly believe that you cannot in and of yourself respond to God. It's only whenever God, uh, by that electing grace, comes and confers life upon you that you know what it is to be saved. But I believe that as we respond to God, yes, God does that quickening work. Yes, God does uh, that renewing work and makes us alive in Christ. But we in and of ourselves have that ability to respond to God, to say yes, to say no to the gospel. And that's all based upon my understanding of man being tripartite in nature. And I'm not asking you to take on all my views, but I am asking you to exercise your heart, to exercise your mind in light of Scripture to a better understanding of what God's Word is teaching us because it is crucial to our future understanding of other Scriptures as we come to them. And so if you've never considered it, if you've never settled on it for yourself, I urge you, have a study at it, have a think about it, but always start here. Because remember what we said a number of weeks ago, there's an important tool to use in Bible study. And what is it? The rule of first mention. And here we have the first mention of how God created man. And I believe that that clearly teaches us he was created in the image of God according to the likeness of God, after the pattern of God. And if God is a triune God, then it follows that man is a triune being, spirit, soul, and body. Not only was Adam a person of status, but Adam was a person with a soul, and Adam then was a person given a standard. Why is that fundamental? It's fundamental because, according to the framework of theology that I hold to, we know that man has been treated in different generations in a different way by God. And this is what is put in place right here at the beginning of creation. And every one of those time periods identified, identified in Scripture is comes with a test now it's not a test where god is simply hoping or desiring or indeed expecting man to trip up and fall and say gotcha not at all god here intends uh, has very clear intentions as he creates man and as he creates man he gives him that standard man remember had the ability to roam all over the earth he had dominion over all the creatures he could rule alongside a lion he could run with a lamb he could swim with a dolphin he could do all of those things he could have an eagle come and rest on his shoulder every creature was under his dominion but there was boundaries that god set And those boundaries were for man's good and for the glory of God. We see that in the verse 16 and the verse 17 of chapter 2. Now remember, God basically had said that the whole world was his. That's given to us there at the end of of chapter 1 of verses 29 and 30. It talks us there, I've given you every herb bearing seed, face of all the earth, every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you. It shall be for me to every beast of the earth. To every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. So God has given freely to man. And his boundaries are set, but they're set not tightly. They're rather, they're set very liberally. 
man has been conf- uh, given to and conferred upon in such a magnificent way by God here in this uh, a week of creation. And here is the standard. Here is the boundary that God places upon man's ability. He says in verse 16, uh, And the Lord God commanded the man, chapter 2, verse 16, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Again, Showing even his generosity, his, uh, the, the, the ability that man had to take that which God had created and to use it for his own enjoyment, his own benefit. But he says, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And so here we see that there were things that man could do quite a lot and there was things that he could not do. And really... We could say there was just one thing he couldn't do. He couldn't eat of that tree. But nevertheless, we know man failed that test. In the end, that temptation to take off that tree was too great. Man was puffed up in that moment. We'll come to look at it uh, in another study. Man was puffed up with pride in that moment. And he consumed of that fruit and he ushered in death. He ushered in sin. But remember, this is a boundary. This is a standard that God establishes here. And yes, that test is placed upon man. Are you going to obey and walk according to the ways that God has ordained and commanded? No great blessing, no great fulfilling and enjoyment here upon earth. Are you going to go your own way? Sadly, man went his own way. And that ushers in another time period then where man is put under a different test. God deals with man in a different way than he does in the first, uh, uh, in the first dispensation, in that first identifiable time period in Scripture. So as we come to consider that for just a few moments, you may think, oh, that doesn't seem very fair. Why would God test man? But remember, this is in keeping with what we've already looked at in 1 John. For 1 John, we looked at the commandments of God. We looked at, of course, those things that God obligates a believer to do. And through it all, John communicates this truth. His commandments are not grievous. They're not burdensome. This wasn't a great burdensome thing for man to simply not eat of one tree in the garden. He had the whole earth. He had everything in the earth. That was his to enjoy, his to use as he willed, but for that one tree. And again, it is that understanding that whenever we come to the boundaries in the Christian life, they're not to harm us. And they're not to cheat us out of fun or enjoyment. They are to protect us. They are to do us good. And that is consistently the theme throughout Scripture as we come to understand the standards of God, the commandments of God, the ways of God. And we know, of course, man breaks uh, the standard here and ushers in other time periods. And we know that mankind lived under the moral law, lived under the Levitical law that was done away with in Christ. We live now under grace. But nevertheless, as believers, we still live with those obligations, those commands of God that he would desire us to do. Love one another as I have loved you. We've looked at that in 1 John. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're not to live like those in the world. We're to be transformed. We're to live like those who have been saved. Draw nigh unto me, I will draw nigh unto you. Be ye holy as I am holy. Watch and continue instant in prayer. All of those things are expectations that God places upon the believer in order that we might bring glory to him and truly in order that we might enjoy the fullest extent of the blessings that are ours as being a believer. And so I remind you, just as we see here, man living under a standard, so too you and I live under a standard. And it is that we live for the glory of him. It is that we take every opportunity to speak of him and to live our lives in a way that pleases him. So as we leave our study for Adam tonight, I simply have one question for you. Are you living in a way that pleases God? God has conferred a great status on us just as he did with Adam. If you're a believer here tonight, then you are a child of God. You're an heir and a joint heir with his son, Jesus Christ. You're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You are one who is eternally the child of God. A place has been reserved for you in heaven. A status has been conferred upon you by a gracious God. Glory to his name. You too have a soul. One that will live everlastingly. And if you've been saved then of course you'll go to that place called heaven. And for all eternity there you will be singing with the ransomed throng above. But let me ask you this. Are you going to be one who goes to that place 
and hangs her head in shame, having nothing to bring with you? Or are you going to know what it is to bring the rewards to heaven and cast them at the feet of Jesus Christ? That you'll see your labor, you'll see even the discipline of your life and the efforts of your life there on the other side as you have invested in eternity here. So you too have a status. You too have a soul. You too live under a standard. Are you living for Christ tonight? If not, then do what is necessary in order that that might be so. Make the changes, pay the sacrifice, whatever the case may be. Do it. Because only in doing what God would have us to do is true joy, true peace, and true happiness to be found. I pray that God blesses these thoughts to our hearts. And as we come to consider more about Adam tomorrow night, I trust that we'll come with anticipation. God bless you. If I told